Peter, it's very good uh, to see you um, uh, today. Uh, thank you very, very much indeed for agreeing to come and uh, record the lecture that you gave at Winkworth Sherwood uh, um, in um, about 10 days ago, I think it was, um, in mid-November on safeguarding and clergy discipline. Uh, a good group of us gathered and your lecture was hugely appreciated and it's really good um, that you're able to now record it so that um, more people in the ELS and beyond can hear your wisdom on the subject. I just want to welcome everybody who is uh, watching this video. Uh, this is an Ecclesiastical Law Society uh, lecture um, originally delivered as a London lecture from Peter Collier. Peter Collier QC, Vicar General of the Province of York and Chancellor of the Diocese of York and the former recorder of Leeds. Peter's going to uh, speak to us today, 50 years of safeguarding, 950 years of clergy discipline. Where do we go from here? Peter, I'll hand over to you now. I think you're going to share your screen. Yes, I will. Uh, Stephen, thank you for the welcome. And uh, what I'm going to do so that people are not distracted by trying to look at uh, what's in my rather untidy study, I'm going to share my screen and uh, so 50 years of safeguarding, 950 years of clergy discipline, where do we go from here? On the 29th of February 2020, I spoke to the Society about 50 years of safeguarding in church and state. Those years covered my 50 years in practice as a barrister and judge. Arising from some observations I made towards the end of the lecture about areas that needed addressing, I was asked to chair a working party for the Society to address how the clergy discipline measure 2003 should be reformed, and we reported in 2021. It was long before that, nearly 18 months ago, that I was asked to provide the title to which I would be speaking tonight. At that time, as far as clergy discipline is concerned, the working party had not even published its interim report, and it was very unclear what would emerge from another working party set up by the House of Bishops under the chairmanship of Bishop Tim Thornton, which was also looking at reform of the clergy discipline measure. As far as safeguarding was concerned, we were awaiting the ICSA report. So 18 months ago, I wanted to leave myself plenty of wriggle room and wait to see what developments, if any, there were in relation to both clergy discipline and safeguarding before deciding in what direction to go this evening. What has happened in the intervening period? Well, in relation to clergy discipline, we produced our report in February this year. Bishop Tim's group produced a report which went to Synod in July, GS 2219. Synod agreed that there should be significant change to the clergy discipline measure, but also backed an additional motion, urging the implementation group to adopt a system more akin to the ELS proposals than the Lambeth group proposals. That implementation group has started work. I am a member, and we're at a very early stage in our work, but it is hoped that we will present proposals to Synod during the course of next year. In relation to safeguarding, ICSA has reported. It has criticised the church in relation to how it has dealt or not dealt with safeguarding in the last 50 years. I want, however, to flag up that its remit is much wider than looking at the Church of England. Its purpose is to consider the extent to which state and non-state institutions have failed in their duty of care to protect children from sexual abuse and exploitation, to consider the extent to which those failings have since been addressed, to identify further action needed to address any failings identified, to consider the steps which it is necessary for the state and non-state institutions to take in order to protect children from such abuse in future, and to publish a report with recommendations. Just over a month ago, it published two reports on the same day. The one that drew all the headlines was about Greville Jenner, but the other was about Lambeth Council. A month before that, it reported on other religious organizations and settings, and it has previously reported on other institutions as well. In all, ICSA has now produced 17 investigative reports. The themes that have emerged are for the most part common to each institution, and to that I'll return. Tonight, I want to draw some threads together as a result of my own work and research into these two subjects over the last two years, 
and to suggest some possible directions in which, in my view, the church ought to move. Any opinions or suggestions I'm, I make are, of course, entirely my own. So first, 50 years of safeguarding. Basically, I want to refer you to what I said in February 2020. Nothing that's emerged since has challenged what I said then. I gave an account of what I had observed firsthand in both state and church over my 50 years in practice at the bar and on the bench. If you uh, read or heard it, you may recall that I began by sketching out the developing understanding of the realities of physical abuse of children in the 1960s. We noted the work of Henry Kemp in America in relation to battered child syndrome. Then the significant change in understanding and practice in this country following the report into the case of Maria Colwell in 1973. Area child protection committees were set up as a consequence of that report and that was the start of the state beginning to organise itself to deal with issues of child abuse. Then there followed during the 1980s a developing understanding of the reality of child sexual abuse. There had been some work in the 1920s to attempt to discover the extent of the prevalence of sexual offending against children and young people. But the proposals resulting from that were resisted by the legal professions, I'm sorry to say, and not taken up by the government of the day. It was in the 1980s that again work in America was published here and taken note of by professionals dealing with children. In March 1986, Esther Ranson invited viewers of the television programme That's Life to send her details of their personal experience of abuse, and over 3,000 responded. She established the telephone helpline Childline in October 1986. 50,000 calls were received within the first 24 hours of its opening. In 1987, we had the concerns raised about children in Cleveland being taken into care as the result of questionable diagnoses of child sexual abuse being made by doctors. That resulted in the Cleveland Inquiry under Dame Butler Sloss. That resulted in proposals about how cases raising a suspicion of child sexual abuse should be investigated. New laws were introduced in 1986 and 1990, 1991, and that's only 30 years ago. The Piggott Report in 1987 made wide reaching proposals in relation to changes to the laws of criminal evidence, which it's taken over 30 years to fully implement. And the last leg of that, section 28, is still only in the pilot phase. The Department of Health report in 1991 reported on 19 cases of abuse in the period 1980 to 89. In the introduction, it said, quote, the mid 1980s saw an increase in the reporting of child abuse. It's not known whether or not the actual incidence of abuse has increased. Public awareness of child abuse increased and critical in this was the emergence of child sexual abuse as a problem which shocked but possibly not surprised the public. Among other things, the emergence of child sexual abuse has led to increased recognition of power and gender as factors inherent in the abuse of children. Close quote. That perhaps indicates how the recognition of abuse taking place within institutional settings began to emerge and be accepted as something that was happening. In 1993, the Home Office published a document entitled Safe from Harm. It was subtitled, A Code of Practice for Safeguarding the Welfare of Children in Voluntary Organizations in England and Wales. And in July 1995, the Church of England published its own policy on child abuse, specifically following the 13 guidelines set out in the Home Office report. As we noted last time, many of the cases that are currently the subject of much angst and self-examination in the church are cases that relate to offending in the 70s and 80s. And we are or ought to be aware that the state, the secular world, was experiencing similar episodes of child abuse by its employees, particularly in children's homes. The most notorious of those were in North Wales and were reported on by Sir Ronald Waterhouse in 2000. We're now aware of similar instances within the world of professional football. For completeness, we should not overlook the institutional response or lack of response by state agencies, including police forces, to the grooming gangs which have only been taken seriously in the last 10 years.
in October 2012, the exposure of Jimmy Savile. So I'll go back to get the right. Um, open the floodgates through which have poured the many people now making complaints of non-recent sexual abuse as they perceive there's a greater likelihood they will be believed. Sorry, Peter, we, I think we've lost the, the slides. You got the slides? No, I can't, we can't see the slides. Okay, we'll try again. So I obviously need to start again. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to repeat what I said last time about how the state responded, how the church tracked the state uh, as the state developed policies for organisations to follow to ensure children's safety and how they should respond to complaints or concerns about abuse. Tonight, we must look at what ICSA has to say about the Church of England. Listen to these words from ICSA. Its actions and decisions made it easy for the sexual abuse of children to occur in four principal ways. It knowingly retained those who posed a risk to children. It failed to investigate when they suspected child sexual abuse. It exposed children to situations where they were at risk of sexual abuse, despite in several cases having knowledge of these risks. And it allowed adults suspected of sexual abuse to move and sexually offend elsewhere without alerting any known employers. In respect of volunteers, it appears that it opened its doors to anyone from the community who expressed an interest in befriending children, for example, playing sports with them or taking them out without any checks on their suitability. In other words, a potential license for child sexual abuse. Does that sound like the Church of England? I've in fact, as you can see, removed a few words uh, which have, would have revealed that it was what ICSA said in its recent report about children in the care of Lambeth Council. But note how similar the themes are to those which we have heard time and again was the inadequate response of the church to disclose their allegations. None of this is intended to lessen the criticisms made of the Church of England, but it is to set the context, which is the context of ICSA's wide scope, which I quoted earlier. In relation to the specific criticisms and recommendations made about the Church of England, significant steps have been taken to address them and to implement their recommendations. ICSA's recommendations are set out in a section of their report. at D4, if you're looking at the report. The report was into the Church of England and the Church in Wales, so some recommendations are joint and some specific to each church. The relevant recommendations of the Church of England are under the six headings that I've listed there on the screen. I will be providing a fuller uh, version of this lecture in text form, uh, and that will set out in a little more detail what they say about each of those six headings. But one of the key criticisms running through the inquiry was the lack of any independent oversight of the church's safeguarding processes. That, of course, links directly to a number of the recommendations, significantly the relationship between bishops and their safeguarding advisors. It also ties into the clericalism and deference that were identified as cultural issues and barriers to a wholehearted embrace of safeguarding across the institution. At the General Synod meeting in April this year, a report GS2204 was presented in relation to what the church was doing to address these issues. Again, I've listed on screen uh, the headings of the uh, paragraphs uh, that deal with the church's response. And the text version of this uh, will give more detail about each of those. It perhaps makes sense that the first of those to be completed is the setting up of an independent three-person independent safeguarding board. But it's the future operational level of safeguarding that was not addressed by ICSA that concerns many of us as lawyers. It looks as if it will be regionally based, although working under national supervision and quality assurance. However, subject to what might emerge from the proposals in relation to revising the operation of core groups, there wouldn't appear to be any major proposal to alter the basic principles upon which the current investigations and risk assessments take place. 
the policy document that describes the current management system is uh, shown here. It's entitled Practice Guidance, Responding to, Assessing and Managing Safeguarding Concerns or Allegations Against Church Officers. The current version is from December 2017. It's been criticised, amongst others, by some of the lawyers on Synod. The operators of the core groups would say that that criticism arises because their role is misunderstood. It's with that in mind that core groups will be renamed when an updated version of that guidance is produced. They will then be known as Safeguarding Case Management Groups, SCMGs. And that's a phrase or acronym that I imagine is already in use and will continue now to be used instead of core groups. In the outside world of child protection, when a core group is established following the initial child protection conference, it is the group of people consisting of the relevant professionals, the parents or carers, and even the child when appropriate, who are together responsible for developing and implementing the child protection plan in being in the case. The church guidance states about its core groups, in its paragraph or section 1.6, the purpose of the core group is to oversee and manage the response to a safeguarding concern or allegation in line with the House of Bishops policy and practice guidance, ensuring that the rights of the victim slash survivor and the respondent to a fair and thorough investigation can be preserved. If there's been no finding by a court, criminal or civil or any statutory agency involvement, then section 3.1 tells us that the church should conduct its own investigation. The core group should establish a process for this to gather information and make an assessment on the facts. I find that an interesting turn of phrase, an assessment on the facts, not of the facts. That's explained further a little later on about what it calls the internal investigation, it says, and it's section 3.3, .3, the aim of an internal church investigation is to establish whether or not there are ongoing safeguarding concerns and whether the respondent is suitable to fulfill a church role which carries the potential for engagement with children, young people and or vulnerable adults. The aim is not, and that's their capitalization, to establish the guilt of the respondent. After that investigation has taken place, it spells out what then happens. The Diocesan Safeguarding Advisor, DSA, prepares what is called a summary report. This appears to be a key document. So what does it contain? Three things. Firstly, what are described as the core details, which amount to name, rank and number of all those involved. Secondly, a summary of the allegations, and that's essentially a list of information gathered, including the respondent's account of the matter. And thirdly, an assessment of the findings. They're itemised as which could include recommendations for further inquiries and will include a clear statement in their opinion on whether the DSA believes the case is substantiated or unsubstantiated, unfounded, malicious or false, and or whether there are ongoing safeguarding concerns. And in a further footnote about the meaning of substantiated, it says, examples of substantiated allegations would include, for instance, a criminal conviction or a finding of fact in a civil court, or where there's been no criminal conviction or finding of fact, where credible and identifiable evidence has been found without implying guilt or innocence. It's this that I find most troubling as there seems to me as a lawyer with both criminal and childcare experience, that there's a lack of the clarity that I would have hoped for. I think it's that lack of clarity that leads to many of the frustrations and also the delays that I have often observed in the church's safeguarding world. In the secular world, there's of course a difference between what would happen in criminal and civil cases. They're doing different things. The criminal world is deciding whether her, a crime has been committed, and if so, deciding what the appropriate punishment is for that crime. In serious cases, it means the deprivation of liberty for the defendant. The criminal court's not concerned with consequences 
or outcomes for other people. The burden of proving the case is on the prosecution and the standard of proof is so that a magistrate or jury is sure that the elements of the prosecution had to prove have been established so that they are sure about them. A not guilty verdict doesn't mean that what is alleged did not happen, just that the jury is not sure that guilt was established, i.e. they were not sure that the essential elements of the offence were proved against the defendant. It's not proof of innocence. We've all seen the acquitted defendant on the steps of the court declaring they've been proved innocent, by which they mean it's been proved or didn't do it. No such thing has been proved at all. Innocence is no more than a legal presumption that you are not guilty and guilt until guilt is established so that a jury is sure. It's something of a circular argument. A non-criminal case operates differently. Whoever brings the case has the burden of proving it. However, the standard of proof is different. It's known as the balance of probabilities. The test is, is the judge satisfied that what is alleged is more likely than not to have happened? If so, the case has been proved. If it is not, not more likely to have happened, then it has not been proved. The courts, both criminal and civil, decide their cases on the evidence presented to them. And there's always a right for the other side to test the evidence, challenge it in cross-examination, and present evidence of their own. However, in both criminal and civil cases, there are occasions when the courts have to make interim decisions before that final determination takes place. In criminal cases, magistrates and judges have to make a decision about whether bail should be denied and a defendant remanded into custody pending that final determination. In civil cases, courts issue, in issue injunctions preventing someone doing what they would otherwise be entitled to do. And in childcare cases, courts sometimes remove a child from the care of their parents because they consider it's in the best interest of the child to do so, which in that context means it's necessary to ensure the child is protected from the risk of being caused significant harm. The test in those childcare cases is whether there are reasonable grounds for believing that a child has suffered significant harm or is at risk of suffering significant harm. The basis for such a belief is the presence of evidence capable of belief that the child has suffered or is at risk of suffering significant harm if that intervention does not take place. Now, I may be thought to be one of those angels dancing on a pinhead if I say that there's a difference between credible evidence and evidence capable of belief. But in my view, credible suggests that an assessment has been made of the evidence and the witness has been believed. Whereas evidence that is capable of belief does not require any assessment other than that it is not incapable of belief. It's for this reason that I find the language of the management document rather confusion. It speaks about the evidence being credible, i.e. we accept it's true, and yet in the same breath it says we are not making any determination of guilt or innocence. Similarly, risk assessors are told they must make no determination about whether something has happened or not, which I find a remarkable basis for any proper risk assessment, but I'll say more of that in a moment. I appreciate that what I'm suggesting has ramifications for resources and therefore for cost. But if we could do this differently, I believe it would be a much better system. There will be a situation when a decision has to be made in order to put in place some protection for children or other vulnerable people. Obviously, that falls to be considered when there's a real possibility there's been significant harm or there's a risk of significant harm. And that will arise in different situations. They have different degrees of urgency and seriousness, which would will determine what will be a proportionate response in the interim. If someone's arrested in relation to child sexual assault, we're at one end of the spectrum. If someone has allegedly failed to comply with some aspect of safeguarding policy, again, I accept there's a range within that, it usually carries a much lower risk of causing or putting people at risk of significant harm. In both cases, the test is, whether there is evidence capable of belief that something has occurred that either has caused significant harm or that puts someone at risk of such harm. In the children cases, it may be a disclosure interview or a hospital admission with a report that injuries have been found 
or some other evidence that something causing harm or risking harm has happened. In the failure to comply cases, there'll be some evidence, usually not in dispute, that something was done that should not have been done or not done that should have been done. On that basis, a decision must be made about what is necessary to prevent harm in the future. In serious cases, the police may have obtained a remand in custody, but sometimes there'll be bail with conditions. One of the more recent problematic situations is what's called release under investigation. In such instances, there are no conditions, there's no time frame, uh, and the police may or may not return to the matter. The police or the local authority may have reported to the bishop under section 361E of the CDM, but the priest presents a significant risk of harm, in which case the bishop can suspend, and there may be need to impose other conditions as well. But in the absence of such a report from the local authority or the police, there will hopefully have been sufficient information sharing to enable the imposition of a safeguarding agreement on the priest in question, as may be necessary in the interim. In the less than serious cases, there may not be such a degree of urgency, and any restraint of the suspected priest is likely to be much less restrictive. Now, there's no need for earnest cell searching if this is recognised as a temporary measure pending some subsequent determination of the allegation. We need to recognise that there can be no full risk assessment at this early stage. It's an interim restraint of a proportionate nature. The real problem comes with any final assessment. I believe that a fact-finding exercise is essential where there's been no external investigation in serious cases, and also in most of the less than serious cases. And I'm using what I hope will become a common distinction. Serious cases are those in which uh, misconduct and discipline would usually result in a prohibition. Less than serious cases are those that would not usually carry that level of sanction. And it would include other cases where it's considered that a risk assessment is necessary, which is more than a temporary holding position. So why do I say that you need to have a fact-finding exercise? Well, let's ask an earlier question. How do you assess risk? Risk is a combination of harm and likelihood. To assess risk, you look at the degree of potential harm and the likelihood of that happening. The degree of, the, the degree of harm following any inappropriate sexual behavior is very high indeed. Some of us in our professional lives have met many people whose lives have been irreparably damaged by sexual abuse. The real question in these risk assessments is therefore not the potential degree of harm, but the likelihood of that harm being occasioned and occasioned by this individual. If you ask any expert in this area, they'll tell you that the only real predictor of future harm is past conduct. That's why the first step in any risk assessment has to be a proper fact-finding evidence based on the evidence of the past conduct. In other words, on the balance of probabilities, is it more likely than not that he behaved in a way indicating that he did abuse someone? or has for some other reason been found to be capable of abusing someone. Now, I could quote case after case in relation to child protection in the family courts that state this principle. An allegation is not proof. Suspicion is not proof. Judges have said that time and again. At the moment, there are many cases where the church is trying to resolve these issues on an unsatisfactory basis. Proposals that will affect someone's life and ministry and much else in the long term are being founded on what is not expressed as more than an allegation. But what is absent from the management process at the moment is any fact finding uh, if there's been no criminal or civil finding. Could that change? Well, clearly the answer to that is yes, it could. But of course, it would require resources and resources cost money. Should that money be spent? I would undoubtedly say yes. It does seem to me that if the reform of the measure proceeds along the route proposed in the ELS Working Party report, we may have a way of resolving this issue. In the less than serious cases of misconduct, there'll be a report within 28 days of the complaint being laid, setting out the investigators' findings of fact where there are disputed issues. In the serious cases, we anticipate a conclusion within six months 
with a narrative verdict about what has been what has found to have happened or not happened. A decision in both less than serious and serious cases will be on the balance of probabilities. And my hope is that we will not be waiting for other jurisdictions to complete their processes. I'll come back to that later. Is there any reason for not doing that or something like it? I'm not really aware of how and why the current process has evolved into what we have, but I would suggest there will be many advantages on piggybacking on such a system as we have proposed. I hope that some discussion can take place about this possibility in the months ahead. Not that it should hold up any revision of the clergy discipline measure, that must proceed apace, but there may well be something that emerges from the future um, measure uh, that could be of use as a process for safeguarding. Now, the second part of my lecture is entitled 950 Years of Clergy Discipline. I wonder what you made in anticipation of the lecture of that part of the title. My real marker is, in fact, next year, when it will be 950 years since the Ordinance of William, William I, the Conqueror. The Ordinance said, uh, I have ordained that the Episcopal law shall be amended because before my time, these were not properly administered in England according to the precepts of the Holy Canons. Wherefore, I order, and by my royal authority, I command that no bishop or archdeacon shall henceforth hold pleas relating to the Episcopal laws in the hundred court, nor shall they bring to the judgment of secular men any matter which concerns the rule of souls. But anyone cited under the Episcopal laws in respect of any plea or crime shall come to the place which the bishop shall choose and name, and there he shall plead his case or answer for the crime. Now I have still have a textbook, uh, it's on the shelves behind me, which I bought in my first year at university in 1966. It's Taswell Longmead's Constitutional History, then and I think still in its 11th edition. I don't think I noticed this particular passage back in 1966, but it reads, the church and the state had been practically identical. Earls and bishops were alike elected and deposed, and laws spiritual and temporal were enacted by the king in cooperation with the Witten. The bishop and alderman sat side by side at the gemot of the shire or hundred, deciding all causes, ecclesiastical as well as civil. That working together goes back to Constantine. Before Constantine, the church would meet together in synods and councils. There they would clarify and define what they believed and how they expected believers to live. That was expressed in the canons. And those synods or councils, uh, judgments would be pronounced on the, at those synods and councils, judgment would be pronounced on those who erred, whether doctrinally or behaviorally. After Constantine, the civil law, which was essentially the Roman law, the canon law and the historic local law were often taken together when judicial decisions were taken. And in England, it worked very well as Taswell Longmead described. But the ordinance of William was a big break with that. It led in England to the development of the Bishop's Consistory Court and the development of practices that were quite different from those in the secular courts uh, that were uh, applying its own law. So to the substance of the law, uh, more emphasis was given to the civil and canon law than the local historical law. As to practice and procedure, it was Roman law that was the model, and the model was developed with the passage of time. One development, which I'll return, was that of office case jurisdiction. But over the centuries following William's ordinance, the church courts developed a significant jurisdiction in quasi-spiritual matters. Marriage, along with separation and annulments, sexual behavior along with adultery and fornication, perjury, which included the failure to pay debts, and uh, finally, uh, cases about spiritual goods, meaning cases about tithes and arms. Those jurisdictions continued and grew significantly in their extent until the 19th century. The Reformation had no effect upon either the substance or procedure of the church courts. It simply resulted in final appeals going not to Rome, but now to the king. There was an intention to draw up a new code of ecclesiastical discipline. And the draft was prepared uh, by a royal commission appointed by Edward VI and led by uh, Cranmer in 1551. However, its proposals did not get through parliament when they were presented in 1553. 
A further attempt uh, in 1571 was again rejected by Parliament. In relation to complaints about the conduct of clergy, the emphasis in the church had always been on emendatio, the reformation and the restoration of the priest, the intention and purpose of reconciliation of restoring the priest and returning into the community has been at the heart of discipline within the church since New Testament times. Pro salute anime, for the good of the soul, has long been seen as the object of ecclesiastical discipline. So priests, when penitent, will be admonished or required to do penance. Research done by Michael Smith in the dioceses of Exeter and London between 1680 and 1839 shows that admonition was the most common penalty imposed on priests. Most ecclesiastical offences were dealt with in that way. Suspension and inhibition were possible, as was deprivation. The ultimate penalty was excommunication, but even that could be removed following repentance. If you were not penitent, then you could be confined in prison until you were. In a fascinating book on the history of prisons, Edward Peters describes the monastic prison used for the confinement of erring monks until they repented. And he tells by the 12th century, bishops were expected to have their own diocesan prisons also. He explains that these had at their heart the concept of reformation and restoration. An act of parliament in 1485, which had as its title, an act to punish priests for incontinency by their ordinaries, amongst other things declared lawful the imprisonment of such men, and I quote, to abide for such time as shall be thought to their discretions convenient, close quote. And it exempted the ordinary from action for false imprisonment. Now we need to understand that as time went by, other developments were taking place in the wider church. The reforms under Pope Gregory emphasized the need for clerics to lead holy lives. But there was also a growing emphasis on clerical independence. And that led to a real battle between church and state, the church asserting its independence and the state asserting its right to judge clerics. A lecture by Roe Williams to the Society last December entitled Saving Our Order, Beckett and the Law, and marking the 850th anniversary of Beckett's martyrdom, touched on an important and to me new aspect of this. He reminded us that the issues between Beckett and the King were much wider than just who could try criminalist clerks. In particular, there were issues of property and the church's freedom to dispose of its property lying at the heart of the dispute, as much as the right to try and punish its priests. He said, and the difficulty for a lay legislator lies in the definition of certain subjects as persons who in virtue of their office or order are as it were separated from any particular acts for which they may be responsible. Their actions are not available to be judged like those of others. I discussed this issue recently with a group of clergy, asking them what they thought were the consequences that flowed from being ordained. A fascinating discussion followed. No conclusions were reached. But it is a matter that the church will have to address as we look again at the issue of clergy discipline in the very near future. Emphasis uh, is often placed upon the fact that it is the uh, church, a priest is an office holder, not an employee. In what way, if at all, should we expect a cleric to be treated differently from the way another professional might expect to be treated as a consequence of their being ordained a priest in the church of God and having taken vows of obedience to the bishop? Rowan Williams went on to say, the price of clerical immunity is an idea of clerical accountability, which ignores the lateral dimension. The cleric is answerable to God and to canonical superiors, but it's not clear what their answerability is to an injured neighbor or community. He also said, quote, as we know with painful clarity, after the revelations of the last decade and more, there's long prevailed a sense that the ecclesiastical superior's first duty is to the spiritual welfare, the emendatio of the individual office holder. Penalties are conceived as penances, moving to a new area, retreat and isolation for a period. It is as if what has been broken is not the bond of trust between the members of a single community, or rather both religious and secular communities in the modern setting, but the obligations for which a cleric is responsible to a superior. And so what has to be restored is not a wrecked and destructive relationship, but a pattern of conformity to duties required. 
end of quotation. The idea in Genesis 4 verse 10 of a brother's blood crying out from the ground has been lost. The state dealt with offences by corporal or physical punishment and or the payment of money. The church had none of that. It focused on the respondent priest and their emendatio. Has that changed now? Are there 21st century expectations that need to be met? Or we'll come back to that. But we need a quick review of the changes that have taken place uh, since the uh, 19th century. First, the state pulled back within the jurisdiction of the king's courts, much of the jurisdiction of the church courts. The first area to go is defamation in 1855, then probate and marriage in 1857, and even church rates and tithes in 1868. And the work of the church courts dramatically declined in that period, as of course did the income of its practitioners. And so Doctors Commons, which had been in existence since the 16th century, was dissolved in 1865. As for clergy discipline, the 18th century had seen the evangelical revival and the rise of Methodism and nonconformity. And those interests were represented in parliament. Mid 19th century onwards also saw the rise of the Tractarian movement. And all in all, there was an expectation of high standards from clergy. Uh, and of course, there were also disputes about doctrine and ritual. And it was evident to all that the ecclesiastical courts were not equipped to deal with any of these new issues in an effective way. And so there are a number of commissions into how the ecclesiastical courts operated. Perhaps the most significant one was that appointed in 1830, which resulted in the Privy Council Appeal Act of 1832, and the Church Discipline Act of 1840. The latter of those was the first of three statutes passed in the 19th century dealing with clergy discipline, and the first of six such statutes in the course of 163 years. The six were the Church Discipline Act of 1840, the Public Worship Regulation Act of 1874, and that was the act that dealt particularly with issues of doctrine and ritual, the Clergy Discipline Act of 1892, the Incumbent Discipline Act of 1947, the Ecclesiastical Jurisdiction Act of 1963, and the Clergy Discipline Measure of 2003. The 1840 Act provided a new procedure for the hearing of complaints against clergy. It was, from its commencement date, the only way of proceeding against a cleric for an offence against the laws ecclesiastical. However, it also stated that it did not, quote, affect any authority over the clergy of their respective provinces or dioceses, which archbishops or bishops of England and Wales may now, according to law, exercise personally and without process in court, close quote. And that's section 25 of the 1840 Act. It would seem that our drawing that to people's attention in our uh, working party report has resulted in recent amendments to the code providing for a rebuke even when a case has been dismissed. Paragraph 147 of the code says, quote, if the conduct of the cleric in question nevertheless uh, raises cause for concern, the bishop may take appropriate and proportion action outside the measure. This might include advice or an informal warning as to future behavior, close quote. Each successive statute or measure was brought in because the previous one was felt not to be working as intended. Often the same problems were cited. Usually they were said to be cost or delay or the difficulty of proving cases. It's interesting to look at and compare some of the differences between them in relation to particular issues. Time forbids me going into detail, but the areas where there were significant differences related to, first of all, who could commence proceedings? Secondly, what could you complain about? Uh, and we see a steady development and widening of the scope of that over the years. And thirdly, what if any preliminary assessment was there? There's a wide variety of practice here. Now our report sets out the working party's views about the current measure and its faults. I'm not going to go into that in any great detail. But I want to look back briefly to the report that lay behind it, Under Authority, which was published in 1996, because it did set out to address the fact that modern expectations must be met with, at least to an extent. But it was a serious error, not in fact, to implement much of what was contained in that report. 
things happened in the process of the making of the legislation that resulted in a very different measure from that that had been proposed by the working party producing under authority. Uh, first, it, it was uh, a serious error not to um, Im implement the need for a quick investigation. Uh, that's what they proposed, a quick investigation to triage all the matters that are now being spoken about as requiring some sort of filtering process. It is mentioned cursory in the code of practice, but the rest of the provisions of the measure mean that such an investigation does not happen. They also intended to sort out the vexatious claims and dismiss them quickly. But what was enacted was legislation that encouraged such claims by widening the scope of misconduct to include not just conduct unbecoming, but inappropriate conduct. Uh, and not um, serious and persistent uh, inefficiency, uh, but just inefficiency. Uh, and uh, there was, of course, no early investigation uh, to identify and dismiss uh, the vexatious claims. But many are now brought under this very wide scope uh, 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 that, 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 that is there. And whereas the report spoke about natural justice and specifically transparency with open observable procedures, we have a system that culminates in a secret report and an unpublished decision which leads then to a tribunal hearing. And when they said there must be no delay, we have an average time from complaint to tribunal hearing of 21 and a half months. The shortest uh, case ever uh, to get to the conclusion of a tribunal hearing was nine months, and that was in the matter that was admitted. The longest case has been 47 months, two others over 30 months, and in eight others, more than two years. The general levels of anxiety and dissatisfaction for all concerned is now very well documented indeed, particularly through the work of the Sheldon community. Now, can we briefly imagine what we might, where we might be today if William had not separated off the bishop's court uh, and, and had not forbidden the bishops sitting down together with the secular leadership, speaking together, working out what to do in each case? I don't have time to rethink how it would have unfolded at different times. But fast forwarding today, what would be the equivalent to the bishop sitting down with the alderman in the Gemot? Of course, we've got many different jurisdictions dealing with different areas of law. And so there are many different people involved in the delivery of justice in different Gemots, depending on the issue. But when professional people are said to fall short in some way, it's the professional standards body, the particular profession, which is the modern day equivalent, or more generally in employment terms, it's ACAS and the Employment Tribunal. Now, do we need in some way to bring back into ecclesiastical legal think what would have happened if the bishop had been required to sit down with the HR director or the head of professional standards or ACAS? And imagine if you can that they'd look together at the canon law and the local historic employment law or law of professional standards and taking the best of both, what would they have come up with? It's not so different from what was attempted in the 19th century or again in 1964. Both were significant times of law reform. And each time the church did look over the parapet and paid some regard to the other contemporary reforms taking place. But it was always overshadowed by the principle pro salute anime. So the bishop usually had a discretion as to whether the proceedings should go ahead or continue. And it's always lacked a true recognition of the horizontal relationships involved in clergy misconduct. Now we wait to see what the current implementation group will propose. But if it should be anything like the ELS proposals, as Synod has requested that it should be, then in reality, all it will be doing is setting up a system very similar to that which was proposed by under authority, but which was bowdlerized by the lawmaking process. What we must have is a speedy investigation to determine whether there is an allegation of serious misconduct. If there's a prime facie case of serious misconduct, then a charge should be laid and the case put immediately before a tribunal where a judge can give directions leading to a speedy trial. And that will be the modern equivalent of office jurisdiction, which I referred to uh, much earlier on. If the investigation does not suggest there may have been serious misconduct, there can be a rapid summary dismissal of vexatious 
and malicious complaints or those allegations that have no substance. If a real grievance is disclosed, an attempt should be made to resolve broken relationships, to put right what went wrong. And if there's been misconduct less than serious, some form of rebuke or advice or requirement for training should be imposed by the bishop. But all must be done openly and transparently with appropriate safeguards and rights of review or appeal. Everything should be concluded quickly, in serious cases within six months, and in other cases, usually within 28 days. Well, we'll watch this space. But how, if at all, might such procedures relate to safeguarding and some of the problematic issues I spoke about earlier? My main concerns around safeguarding are delay and process. First, delay. One of the problems with delay, particularly in serious cases, is the current CDM guidance in the code is that if there are secular proceedings taking place, the church should wait for them to conclude. It's paragraph 90 of the Clergy Discipline Code. Uh, and it says, any criminal matter should be investigated and resolved by the relevant secular authorities, e.g. the police, child protection agencies, HM Revenue and Customs, before any related disciplinary proceedings under the measure are resolved. And safeguarding management uh, guidance doesn't address the issue in quite such a clear way, but paragraph 2.9 would seem to imply that they wait for statutory agency investigations to conclude. It says, any internal safeguarding investigation remains subjudicial until the conclusion of any statutory agency investigation. I'm not sure about the word subjudicial. I think it means subjudice, and that the authors of the policy document don't really understand the concept. But my concern about waiting and going second is the current timescale for criminal investigations and prosecutions. There's been quite a bit of publicity in recent weeks about the backlog in the courts. Currently, in November 2021, when a case of sexual assault arrives at the Crown Court, it's likely to be late in 2022 or more likely 2023 that the trial will be listed to take place. And all that is on top of increased time from the first report of the crime to the point of charge, often now about a year. We cannot and should not wait that long to deal with disciplinary matters. It's in no one's interest to do so. And perhaps the presumption uh, that uh, the secular authorities must proceed first should be reversed. The clergy discipline rules as amended in 2021 and which came into effect on the 13th of January, uh, 13th of July, 2021, by rule 28A, enable either the designated officer or the respondent to apply to the presence of tribunals for an order for production of documents by a person who's not a party to the allegation of misconduct. That has limited scope at the moment, it can only be done between the matter being referred to the designating officer for investigation and the president deciding under Rule 29 whether there's a case to answer. But it's a step in the right direction. And the rule goes to the root of the rationale behind waiting for other investigations to complete their course. If we can obtain some of the information they hold, is there any reason at all for waiting perhaps three years for a criminal case to conclude? We have a different purpose and a different standard of proof. It's in everyone's interest that we move quickly to a conclusion that will resolve questions about the clerk's future and bring closure for all, including the complainant and the parish. And I noted uh, on some further reading the other day uh, that, for example, the police um, professional standards bodies now investigating misconduct will not wait for criminal trials to take place un unless uh, it's necessary in the interest of justice to do so, but they will proceed to deal with the disciplinary matters uh, straight away. So what about the way ahead? Well, serious cases should have completed their passage to and through a tribunal within six months. Question of risk will arise in serious cases initially when the bishop's considering whether to suspend. In our report, we propose that necessity should be the test in all cases for suspension. ACAS guidance about when an employee should be suspended and its emphasis that it's a matter of last resort is helpful and could be imported as part of the test. But following the tribunal hearing, there'll be a narrative verdict. Facts will have been found, whatever the outcome. If the allegations are proved, then usually appropriate Inhibition will follow, but risk will still need assessing, and it can be done by professionals. A forensic psychologist would perhaps be the person to use in many cases. 
But if the allegation is not proved, the question will arise as to whether there is a risk on the facts that have been found. If there is, then again, the question of assessment of that risk falls to be made. How should that be done? Again, it must be on the basis of those found facts. What about less than serious cases? Many of the current safeguarding cases arise from a cleric failing to abide by guidelines. The vast majority of those cases are clearly not serious misconduct. They're never going to call into question whether the ministry should continue. In those cases, a quick fact finding uh, is called for. If misconduct is then found, uh, perhaps a rebuke of some sort can be given. In some cases, further training may be proposed. Again, the question of risk can be looked at. On the facts, is there a risk? What is necessary and proportionate to guard against those risks? But all this potentially changes the rules of the game in relation to risk assessments. It does away with the problems around the idea that credible and identifiable evidence has been found without implying guilt or innocence. And there's no reason at all that I can see why the safeguard, safeguarding professionals should not, should not buy into what I have been proposing. Of course, sometimes when a disclosure is made, there has to be an external referral. But let's assume that that's been done and the initial police interviews have taken place. Why shouldn't reference not be made by way of laying a complaint under these new procedures at that point? So we've looked back over 950 years of clergy discipline and 50 years of safeguarding. The safeguarding policies and practices have developed quite independently of clergy discipline processes. Perhaps the time has come for them to come much closer together. As we've seen, discipline needs to have a proper regard to the cleric's horizontal relationships and to any harm or dom damage that has been done by their misconduct. The safeguarding processes need a securer legal route, particularly in relation to risk assessments than they've managed to construct so far. The Archbishop of Canterbury's agreement when questioned by ICSA that the CDM was not fit for purpose in relation to safeguarding has been overtaken by a perception that it's generally not fit for purpose and is in need of not just refreshing, but reinventing. And it seems to me that it would be to the benefit of both if the early and speedy investigation that discipline requires could also encompass an early and speedy investigation properly to inform risk assessments and the associated issue of suspension. We shall have to see whether these two work streams can come together, talk together and design something together that will transform both clergy discipline and safeguarding each of which are viewed with great suspicion by lawyers, whether ecclesiastical or otherwise, at the present time. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much indeed for that um, hugely insightful and fascinating lecture. There weren't many highlights of lockdown for any of us, but a highlight for me was uh, serving on the Ecclesiastical Law Society Working Party uh, under your chairmanship uh, on the reform of the clergy discipline measure. Um, and I know the society, and I would think the whole Church of England uh, owes you a debt of gratitude for your energy and for the wisdom that your, your voice is bringing, both as seen in that report that was produced by the group, but also in the continuing work that's being done um, as safeguarding and particularly clergy discipline, is being reformed. So, Peter, thank you for your ongoing work. Thank you for delivering this lecture uh, twice, this time round, and also for the, 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 the first instalment uh, back, back in, in Leeds um, before COVID began. Uh, we're very grateful indeed. Thank you.